I think many of us want to know, are we about to end up in another war with the Middle East? After 20 plus years of being at war with this region of the world, $9 trillion in money spent, it's not something that we want to do. Today, I have a expert guest, Dr. Walid Ferris, to help me better understand this. Dr. Ferris, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really going to be enjoying this conversation, knowing the quality of your program. Oh, thank you so much. So uh, just for people that uh, maybe are new to you, Dr. Ferris is an author, geopolitical expert with a focus on terrorism, counterterrorism, the Middle East. He also helped uh, immensely with the Trump administration. Uh, Dr. Ferris, depending on which side of the news you read, I'm reading that the United States military is gearing up to go to war with Iran. Uh, things are spinning out of control in the Red Sea. If I read the other, the other wing of the news, uh, things are de-escalating. President Biden has this under control. A as an expert, what are, what are you seeing that we're maybe missing? Well, the truth may be or facts may be in between the two visions, because one vision is saying, well, look at the news. Uh, we have our U.S. Navy, uh, you know, uh, engage in firefight with the Houthis in, in Yemen. That's not a joke. That is a war by itself. We have our forces in Iraq and Syria being hit by Iran-backed militias. Uh, we have our ally Israel in a full-fledged war in Gaza with a lot of back and forth in terms of what the international community thinks, what the United States thinks, and what others. We also have, uh, you know, an Iran militia attempt to silence their own population. That is very close from a civil war. And note, obviously, we have the ongoing Ukraine war and what could happen in Asia if China, you know, take a look at Taiwan and says maybe that's the time. So we have ongoing wars. What we also have is a U.S. policy, this administration's policy, which is, in my view, as somebody who observed this administration and the Obama administration for a long period of time, they are in chaos. Uh, there is no plan, in my view, to handle, first of all, the aggressivity of the Iranian regime. There is no plan to re-coordinate, as was the case under the Trump administration, with the Arab friends, the allies who have been part of the Abraham Accord. We could talk about that. And relations are not that good with the, with Israel's government. So we have wars growing and we have a mismanagement, I may say, I'm using this term, by the US, the current US administration of how to handle. It's not easy to say I'm exiting. We saw what happened in Afghanistan, in the summer of Afghanistan. We exited in a dramatic way. We left behind us $80 billion plus or minus uh, worth of weapons to the Taliban. The Taliban are now bringing Al-Qaeda, bringing the ISIS and everybody else. And they are most likely behind the um, explosion of jihadi murders and attacks from Nigeria to Sudan to elsewhere. So that would be my reading, a more objective reading, qualifying that, yes, the administration is trying to get out, but that's what the problem is, the tragedy of how to get out. And of course, the ongoing wars, which I see not stopping until 2025. Oh gosh, wow, okay. Um, you, you definitely saw this photo. I remember when things started to turn and go ugly under Biden with the Afghanistan withdrawal. He's, he's sitting in the, it looks like a war room. There's flags, there's you know six or seven TV screens. And he just looks depleted and, and beat down. Um, is that kind of the general feeling at the White House and with the Pentagon? You, you mentioned that uh, from your perspective and having lived through multiple administrations, things are in chaos. What do you mean by that? It is more than chaos. Let me explain to your audience, a smart audience, that chaos will end quickly because some organized force will come and then end the chaos. That's usually what happens at least in our type of democracies, or a coup in other type of uh, regimes. What's happening is an organized chaos by very powerful lobbies. And I will mention at least two of these lobbies. One is the Iran regime lobby, which is extremely influential in Washington, has people uh, having penetrated our bureaucracies for years. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, other newspapers, the uh, Washington Beacon, they have actually published articles and named people 
inside our bureaucracies. And that's not just from yesterday or last week, that's from last year and years before, uh, who are actually influencing our foreign policy. But two more important is that the Iran deal as a whole, the lobby of the whole Iran deal, it's not just Iranians. These are financial interests in the United States and Western Europe who wants to make money from that deal, have been so pressuring on this administration. That's why that could explain part of the picture that you're talking about, that the president and his immediate team get two, three kind of opinions. The Pentagon and the agencies are saying, well, Iran is expanding. But then the negotiators of the Iran deal are saying, no, no, we should not enerve Tehran. We should not respond. We should be measured. So the public, both in America and in the region, is wondering what is going on. This is not a normal US policy. But there is also, of course, since you mentioned the Taliban in Afghanistan, the Muslim Brotherhood lobby, the Ikhwan lobby, which is was used to be backed by Qatar, which also has been doing a lot of uh, influence on our foreign policy. So what appears to be chaotic is chaotic, but it's provoked by those two lobbies. And why? So that they can execute the policies they want. Imagine, and I'll finish with this point, that some of the bureaucrats, this is public information, who actually are in touch with the Iran regime and have high clearance present, you know, positioning in the DOD and other parts of our uh, administration, have exchanged emails with the foreign minister of Iran and have been asking them, what would you like us to do? I mean, we have laws against this. So we have a very problematic situation. The president himself doesn't seem to understand beyond national security many other things. And I'm not going to be the one to report on this. Everybody is seeing it. And I think that this ship is being led by lobbies at the end of the day. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Uh, I can't remember his name, but there was a former head of the CIA who said, uh, after looking over Joe Biden's foreign policy track record for 50 years, he's been wrong on almost every foreign policy decision. Um, with that said, uh, I don't know if this is a political talking point because we're in an election year or not, but there, I, I've read a lot about uh, President Biden removing sanctions, removing people off terrorist lists, allowing the flow of money for oil uh, partnerships with China. Has President Biden, in fact, strengthened Iran, or is this just a talking point from Donald Trump to get clicks? No, this is way beyond Donald Trump. I mean, Donald Trump came to the political game in 2015 when I met him for the first time. We had some briefings before I was appointed by him as his first foreign policy uh, advisor. So I know, I know the candidate and I know the politician and then the president before and after, before he was involved and after he was involved. This is much older. Than, uh, than Donald Trump. This is basically the result of a transaction, and I'm calling it transaction of purpose, it's in my book, uh, that the former President Obama in 2014 to 15 executed with the Iran regime. He announced that we will be, as the United States and partners in the West, sending up to $150 billion to the Iran regime in return of Tehran stopping its nuclear program, so-called nuclear program. And that has started even in 2009, when the, uh, when the administration of Obama for, was formed. He sent letters to the Grand Ayatollah of the Iran regime, uh, the Grand Ayatollah Khamenei, and he asked him if the US and Iran's regime can partner. So this is not something overnight. This is not from few weeks or months. So whatever President Biden and his team have inherited from the previous administrations, meaning the Obama administration, it's the same team that negotiates, is basically a policy. So to answer your question, yes, that policy wanted the United States not to escalate, not to stop the Iran regime and the return. Now, here's the big deal for your viewers. The return seems to be favors for financial interest in the United States and Western Europe. This is the only thing that can explain this relentless return to the deal, even after the withdrawal from Afghanistan, after the Trump administration withdrew from the Iran deal, designated its revolutionary guard in 2018, and then, of course, in 2019, after the Abraham Accord was signed. Imagine all of these achievements of the previous administrations. The, the Biden team simply, on day one, you mentioned delisting. Well, of course, in February, the beginning of February of 2021, uh, the Biden administration, out of nowhere, delisted the Houthis. The Houthis are now attempting to suffocate world economy, how would on earth delist them 
instead of asking them to make concession to disarm, to join their, you know, we pressured the Saudis and the Emiratis to stop the campaign against the Houthis. Guess what? We are doing it right now on we dying. We actually pressured the Israelis not to escalate against Hezbollah and Iran and look where the war is at this point in time. So there is, unfortunately, an influence that came from the monies of the Iran deal that has been pressuring our policy to be as it is right now. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the Houthis really have had uh, a dramatic def- effect on global trade through the Red Sea. It, it's been really interesting to, to watch. Um, you, you mentioned that these wars could uh, drag out till 2025 or even escalate into 2025. By then, there, there could be a second term of Donald Trump. How do you think things would look differently under Trump versus under Biden? Yeah, that, that, that's what I do in terms of consulting at this point in time, media and, and the private sector. I project events. I published a book in 2010, just one year before the Arab Spring, and the title was uh, The Coming Revolution. So we look at those trends, we look at social media, we look at ideologies, and we can project. Those five wars that we are looking at in the Middle East, not talking about Ukraine at this point in time, uh, the fight between Iran militias and our forces, this is going to drag. Because here's the problem. That's war number one. If we leave immediately, Iran will go all the way from Iran through Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Syria, to the Mediterranean Sea. That would be with consequences that are you know, incalculable. It's just terrible. So we have to you know, withstand that pressure. And our allies, the Kurds and some Sunni moderates and Christians will be again uh, destroyed by the Iran regime. In Gaza, if we continue to pressure the Israeli uh, government to have a ceasefire, but the ceasefire they're requesting now is one of we stop, we don't touch ha- Hamas, and we start the ballet of meetings, except what would Hamas do? Hamas is getting money, is getting weapons. They will you know, reload they would you know reorganize and and go ahead and it's not just against israel it would be against the arab uh, countries the moderate countries and if we don't stop the war if we don't disarm or end the power of the houthis you just mentioned it we're going to enter a mother of economic crisis worldwide it's like 1973 12 to 15 percent of world economy goes through the red sea into the suez canal and that's going to hit europe it's going to hit us here at home so 2024 is going to be a year to observe and watch if this administration and their allies in Europe are going to really do what they need to do or not. If not, then the possibility of having a Trump administration is very clear. The public will make that choice. We're not going to make it. The public will make it. The voters. If that happens, I know from what I know is that there will be a different agenda under a Trump administration. Reversing completely every single policy that reversed his policies which actually have reversed the Obama policy. So let me give you quick examples. Number one, no way to send money to Iran. That's number one. That's on our one. We have to stop the transfers of money and billions of dollars to the Iran regime because the Iran regime is using them against us, by funding the militias, et cetera. Number two, we're going to reconvene the Arab coalition. We're going to reconvene, when I say we, meaning whomever is going to be in the White House and the State Department, the Abraham Accords. Number three, there are, there are matters even related to our national security and safety at home that are being used now by those two threats, the Iranian regime and the jihadists, our southern border. It's not just a domestic issue. It's an international issue. It's organized. So if a Trump administration is formed, it will have barely the time because it's going to be under huge pressure by the opposition. We saw what happened in 2017. Multiply it by five or 10 because so much money was spent especially from the Iran deal against uh, the previous administration that expect, expect the worst. But that's the plan that a new Trump administration, if it forms, uh, would be, would be summarized. Okay. Uh, help, help me understand. I, I mean, I, I read that uh, Donald Trump is nominated for the Nobel Prize because of the Abraham Accords. Why, why are those so important uh, to, to keep things organized and orderly in the Middle East? Because if we don't, then we have foes. And the foes are just named them the Iran regime and all the militias, the four or five militias. We have the Muslim Brotherhood. We have the jihadists. We have ISIS revived now. We have the Taliban. And we have the influences of Russia and of China. 
they're not going to come to do war in the Middle East, but they're supplying weapons. So that's why I imagine a, a Trump administration will re-engage Russia, or engage in the sense telling them what are the borders, what are the limits. You cannot be, you know, funding Iran and you know working on 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 strengthening Iran and China. If you want to do business with us, you cannot be helping the rogue state. And those two countries, they are nuclear, but they they are also business countries. They right? want to make money. We're not in the fifties and the sixties. Even China, the communist China, is now nothing but a capitalist federation of interests wrapped with the robe of 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 communism. It's over. It's all capitalism. So they need someone. An alternative to this administration, of course, Trump now is the head, uh, you know, he's, he's the probably the potential uh, nominee, and there are no other people, so people will have to have him, there is no other solution in terms of our political system, and so his method, of course, he will learn from the past mistakes. Many around him did not serve him well. I don't want to go into domestic politics, but at least those in uh, some positions that criticize him after that, he should come with a Trump II administration not a second administration of it's an absolutely no one with new teams people who have learned their mistakes and new talents as well we have seen over the past four or five years many talents so that new trump administration i'm gonna say it clearly and i mentioned it to him one time uh will have to face very difficult times first year will be the reorganization and then they will have three years to defeat all these challenges to the United States from North Korea to what's happening in the, uh, you know, in the caucuses in the Middle East and North Africa. So it's going to be a big challenge, but there is no other option than changing the current policy. Look, I'm going to end by saying, if this administration, despite all the problems that it has uh, produced, changed course tomorrow, after tomorrow, I'll say, fine, we'll support you till the end of your administration. But if this is not going to happen, America need to have an alternative policy and therefore administration. Yeah. Wow. 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 Okay. Um, I, I know that your your focus is the Middle East, but with Russia strengthening ties with Iran, uh, how dangerous is it that President Biden hasn't really communicated with Russia in almost two years? Don't don't we need to uh, reopen communication with Russia and 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 commerce in order to get them? to keep Iran uh, in check, or am I not thinking correctly on that? You are absolutely thinking correctly. And of course, uh, Washington is divided, America is divided between two camps. I'm from a third camp, two camps. One would say, we're gonna fight Russia and Ukraine until Russia collapses. It's not gonna happen. This is not going to happen. Better to find a settlement. In that settlement, the negotiators, as a new administration, must be firm, must be absolutely firm. The Russian leadership understand only when you are firm and find a way to do it. Second, what the public here didn't realize is that Russia is changing. Yes, it's true that Putin is reorganizing his strength and his regime and so on, but the youth, the Russian youth, you speak with them, Russian people, they wanna be Westerners. I mean, you see them here in America, you see them in, 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 in Moscow, they understand that they are have issues on the eastern and southern part of Ukraine on ethnic grounds. That's a different story that can be negotiated. It can be, and both sides need to negotiate it. But the Russian people is not sympathetic, neither to the Taliban nor to the Iranian regime. They, they are not practicing what the Iranian regime is practicing. Someone has to speak with the Kremlin and tell them, you guys from St. Petersburg to Los Angeles, we belong to a one civilization. You know, and it, that civilization is attacked by the jihadists. So you're doing the wrong alliances with Iran because Iran, at the end of the day, is going to influence the caucuses, is going to influence the whole world. And they are playing Russia against America and America against Russia and strengthening themselves and obtaining the nuclear force. That's what they're doing. So, yes, there is a way, there should be a way for Washington and Moscow to speak, to settle the issue of Ukraine, you know, in, in all fairness, and after that, to concentrate on the actual problems of the world, which is terrorism, in my view, that's the number one problem. Yeah. Okay, you've, you've written this book about Iran, Iran, an imperialist republic and U.S. policy and what readers, um, excuse me, U.S. policy. Um, he help us understand why, why did you write this book? Um, what can we expect to learn? And if you are asked to be a part of a future Trump administration for the Middle East, would you would you consult? Would you be willing to do that again? 
Well, number one, this book is one I, I consider of the most important books I've published. I've published 15, 16 books, in addition to the, you know, icon books, book, uh, Future Jihad, which I published in 2005. But Iran, uh, Imperialist Republic, explains two things. That Tehran had strategy and an ideology and a vision that, you know, uh, went beyond all our presidencies. Presidencies are four to eight. These guys are three decades, four decades old. They are chess players. So I explained throughout the book how they actually fooled many of our administrations and took the control of multiple colonies. Iraq is a colony. They used our force to kick Saddam Hussein, and then they grabbed Iraq. They are using our force in, 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 in Syria, and then they have an alliance with Assad. In Lebanon, they have, of course, Hezbollah, I mean, the Houthis all the way in the, on the Indian Ocean are also a production of that regime. So we're not dealing with an overnight you know, expression of a bad, bad party or bad actor. This is serious. This is like the Soviet Union. The worst that we've done is that multiple administrations, two of them, the Obama administration, the Biden administration, and the circles around them, they have produced a transfer of money a transaction, which, excuse me, <clears throat> profited the Iran regime. We gave energy. We gave oxygen to the Iran regime. And to do so, people ask me, I mean, those administrations, are they that naive? I say, no, it's not naive at all. The Iranian regime used the money that they received, which is the Iranian money at the end of the day and frozen, uh, but it's not the regime's money, it's the people's money. So the people didn't get it, the regime got it. And I'm not convinced that if we send $150 billion to that regime and their allies, they're going to just you know, act like uh, Mother Teresa. They didn't support the economy of the country. They actually armed the militias. And they've done something I want the readers to, to see it by themselves, uh, chapter 8 and 9. They have funded a lobby in the West. They have funded a lobby in America. So money came back here. So... Let me give you an example, which is in the book. If $150 billion goes east towards that regime, you would imagine that 10% will have to come back to consultant, to law offices, to media, to academia. That's $15 billion. $15 billion, you could do anything in a liberal democracy. It's an important you know, issue I'm raising, and I hope now that Congress has spoken with many members, they're interested in actually investigating what, what happened. We, Congress was not informed neither about the Iran deal they have never signed uh, on the off on the Iran deal, and still the last transfer of money they had, you know, nothing to do with it. Now, to answer your second question, you know, I'm a U.S. citizen. I'm an American patriot, so I will have to decide if I'm offered, you know, an obligation. It's an obligation for me more than a position, and I need to serve this country because myself and the generation, you know, after me, my 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 children. Um, they want, I want them to live in a free America. What's happening now is taking America to the abyss. And that, I cannot accept it. I've went through this. I'm a born and raised in Lebanon. The uh, jihadists and the Iranians occupied, invaded. I saw what happened after that. I saw Hezbollah. I don't want to see this happening here. So if I am asked, I will consider very seriously uh, to serve, but only when it happened. Yeah, uh, well... God bless you. Thank you so much for your service, uh, consulting, helping us understand uh, a, a completely different way of thinking, a, di a different region of the world. You know, we 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 assume that people think the same way; they they really don't. But uh, and and your, your brilliance of connecting the dots of we gave them the money to then re-infiltrate us and ex expand. Uh, really, really fascinating, uh, Doctor Ferris. I'm going to leave a link to your book down below. If yes. people want to follow you online, what's the best way to do that? The easiest way, my friend, is to spell my name. That's the code. W-A-L-I-D Ferris, P-H-A-R-E-S, Walid Ferris. At. You will go to Twitter, to Instagram, Facebook. Everything is at Walid Ferris. And okay. they can get to me. They could leave a comment. They could even get a signed copy of the book, whatever they want. Okay. I'm going to put a direct link so they don't even have to search it. They can just go right there and write okay. to the book. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to speak with me. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. And my best to your audience and yourself. Thank you.